Hello, and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. The key to spiritual and emotional health is to grasp the truth of God's transforming love for us, and then let that reality influence our own hearts and relationships. It seems simple, but we are experts at complicating simple things. Instead of living lives characterized by love, we find ourselves trapped in cycles of shame, violence, and addiction that steal our joy and keep us from loving others, so much so, by all indications, Christians are living no differently than anyone else when it comes to abuse rates, use of pornography, alcohol, and drug addiction, and more. Dr. Timothy Jennings has been in private practice as a Christian psychiatrist and certified master psychopharmacologist since 1997. Board certified in psychiatry by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, he's a specialist in transcranial magnetic stimulation, a drug-free treatment for depression. He spent more than two decades researching the interface between biblical principles and modern brain science and is a highly sought after lecturer and international speaker and the author of The God-Shaped Brain and The Aging Brain, as well as the Remedy Bible Translation. He's in private practice in Chattanooga, Tennessee. You can find more about his ministry at his website, comeandreason.com. He appears here on the third Thursday of every month at 10 a.m. and is the author of The God-Shaped Heart, How Correctly Understanding God's Love Transforms Us. I want to welcome in my good friend, Dr. Timothy Jennings. Tim, so great to see you here to talk about uh, this very timely, relevant topic about love. Uh, I think that, uh, of course, God said it best, but the Beatles did a pretty good job when they said all you need is love. And uh, that's what the antidote for the troubles on American streets and communities is today. And you've written a uh, stellar uh, blog on comeandreason.com uh, in regards to love, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, thank you. Eric, thanks for having me back as uh, the third Thursday of the month, and I always enjoy looking uh, forward to being with you. And you're exactly right. Love is, love is the power that actually transforms lives. But, but many people don't know how to actually practically um, put love into action. They may understand the feelings of goodwill or compassion or empathy or have a desire to see good for people. But oftentimes in real life circumstances, they get confused on what the action of love should take and allow, in fact, warm feelings to interfere with the function of love that and, and, and they can actually make things worse how does that work well for instance um sometimes when we love somebody and they're in a situation that the situation is painful to them if we over empathize and focus only on relieving pain we might actually contribute to them getting worse so you have a child who, or a friend who's dislocated a joint. Uh, if you love them, you will, in the most helpful and easy way possible, relocate the joint, reduce it, put it back in place. But as you do that, there is a moment or a period where their pain actually gets worse. And if our focus is only on, well, I can't do that because it will hurt them. Uh, and so I can't take an action that would cause an increased experience of pain because that wouldn't be an act of love. Love never hurts, uh, d never has an action that has pain or hurt associated with it. No, the truth is love never harms or injures. But many actions of love can cause momentary or experiential pain. Uh, if somebody had a broken limb and in the aftermath of their bone has been set, now they've been sent to physical therapy. And as they start to do their physical therapy, as they start to do the exercise, they cry because it hurts. If you love that person, maybe it's your spouse, do you ask them to get off the machine and you do the exercises for them so they won't feel the pain? That would not be an act of love. That would infantilize them, would keep them disabled. How about you have a grandma who is 80 years of age and she's got arthritis and when she walks, it hurts. Will you? Uh, get, will it be an act of love to buy her a motorized wheelchair so she doesn't have to walk anymore? Or if she uses the wheelchair and stops walking, does she get weaker and lose the abilities that she has? And so one of the things you have to have in addition to the welfare of the other person in mind is you have to have an understanding of how reality works. 
because um, I'll give you an example. George Washington, president of the United States, first president, died of pneumonia. But when he died of when he got pneumonia, the doctors leached him and bled him because they wanted to get out the evil humors. Well, let's just assume those doctors actually had his best interest at heart. They have human love for their president and they wanted to save him. Their human love for him and wanting to save him did not actually work out for him because they didn't understand how the laws of health worked and so they harmed him even though they were trying to help him so when we really want to love people we not only have to have their best interests at heart but we have to really understand what operationally in reality is in their best interest how do we obtain that that balance because i can remember uh back in 1980 i had a uh a surgery um, on my knee and I remember that the next morning uh, in the hospital, they came and they got me out of bed. And it was beyond fathomable how much pain I had in then just trying to swing my leg out, which was uh, neutralized, it was fixed. Yeah. And how much pain there was <clears throat> in getting me upright. And uh, you know, I felt like I was going to Helga's house of pain. Yeah. Uh, they got me up and walking. <coughs> Excuse me. And was that an act of love for you? Would, 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 it, would it have been better for them to say, we won't ever um, get you up until you have no pain? No, I, w I would have never been. Here it is 40 years later. I've had no problems with it because I suffered through the therapy, knowing that it would hurt for a while but the benefit would be long term. See, we get that when it's physical, don't we? We do. How about when it's not a broken leg, it's a broken heart? Somebody's been traumatized or mistreated in a relationship, maybe as a child, maybe as an adult, uh, and they have trauma wounds in their heart to heal. Do those same principles apply? That no matter how much an external person loved you, they could not take your pain away from your knee. No matter how much we love a traumatized person, we can't take their pain away. But we can assist them, encourage them, stand by them as they work through the issues to find healing. But won't the working through be painful? Ab absolutely. And yet we have the idea that that the act of love is to never confront somebody with truths that are painful, then we never bring truth into people's lives. And this is one of the, the things that's happening in our society today, is that there are truths that need to be presented to people's lives. Historically, we'd call it the gospel truth. And historically, gospel truths brought people to conviction, and, and they would have heart-rending grief as they saw the sin in their own lives, and that would bring them to repentance, and they would have joy and peace. But in many societies today, preaching the gospel that brings conviction of sin is, is uh, considered uh, uh, hate speech that 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 uh, you're 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 trying to hurt somebody you're trying to run them down you can't bring gospel truth to someone's life and so there is this idea out there now that we only need to speak words that make people feel good rather than words that are designed to bring healing to their lives i can tell you as a psychiatrist there are many times in therapy with patients i care deeply about that i've had to speak words to them and we do it in the way this is the bible principle truth in love so i express my concern my compassion my desire for their welfare so they know the reason i'm saying this to see them heal but some things i have to present to them they find painful in this current situation where we have the weaponization of shame uh, as we take a look at some of the messaging that's coming out, um, it is certainly true that 60, 70, 80 years ago, when there was segregation, that communities were uh, largely underfunded, uh, became ghettos, and uh, this was something that was never reversed. There was there was. Uh, it was a result of an action, and here we are sitting in a situation where uh, the community is saying, we want you to love us this way. We don't want you to come in with your church 
we want you to support our church or local in the community. We have the youth programs. We would just love to have a new gymnasium and have more youth in the community come to it and get connected with the church. But you want to come in and build your new uh, multi-campus church and put one of those campuses in our environment and you're not going to be sticking around late at night uh, providing the services that we provide. You're not going to be connecting with the families like we connect. Uh, you're going to come in and your doors during the week are going to be closed because you're not having services. Our doors aren't closed. We, we have youth programs. We have safe havens. We have places for battered women. We have places where uh, we're, we're getting uh, the youth plugged in. And if we can get them plugged in, we're going to teach them how to be good fathers. And when they get married, they're not going to leave their families. And we've already had a direct impact on this. We know this. And you're trying to tell us to do it your way. And we're asking you to support us to grow it our way. Is, is, that, is that an expression of love uh, in first taking some responsibility uh, every person in America is afforded the same opportunity to get out of whatever circumstances they're in. And I can say that with experience as a persecuted Jew, but also as someone who is homeless. I was a very successful businessman. And when the Carter administration came in and interest rates went to 18%, it put me out of business. And when I went out of business, because I had personally guaranteed everything, uh, I lost my home. I lost my car. I lost my family. I had nowhere to go. I had no roof over my head. I had no address. Now, smart, whatever, I wound up getting a job with a limousine company because they let me keep the car. And I began to parlay. Uh, I'll trip, I went to every hotel in downtown Atlanta and said to the managers, listen, I'll take you and your wife on a limo-driven dinner for your anniversary if you give me an empty room to sleep in, if you allow me to eat off a of room service trays, if you will let me avail myself of your laundry services in your hotel. And I had seven hotels that I did that with, so I was never in the same hotel uh, for two consecutive nights taking advantage of them. And whether or not it was the security people or it was the catering people or whoever it was, I found a way to thrive in a very difficult situation. Now, was I a victim? I was not a victim. Uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't have good feelings towards the Carter administration, but I wasn't going to live my life in a cardboard box. But I also had the shame and never told my family and never asked anybody for help. And basically, I disappeared from my friends and disconnected from my community because I didn't want them to know what happened to me. And there was probably help. There was probably another job. I just wasn't willing to do that. I was determined that I was going to work my way out of this based on my knowledge and my strength. And it took two years. And it was a fair. Uh, and it was actually Bert Lance, who was the Office of Management Budget in the Carter administration, who, I, who was somebody I picked up at the airport. And I told him my story, and I told him he was at fault, and he was to blame. And he rolled with me for two years before he actually helped me get a job with AT&T. And so um, I know that even in oppressive situations, that there is opportunity for those that are willing to make opportunity if they're willing to grab a hold of whatever it is that they can grab a hold of. But societally, uh, there are certain imbalances that we have allowed uh, which are a remnant of a past. They're not a present. They are a remnant of a past, and we're being reminded of that past, and we're being challenged to do something to correct some errors of the past and invest in a community by applying this love. But is, so, so, is, is love something that I give my way, or do I look at the Dr. Gary Chapman's and say, I need to not only know what my love language is, how I express love, but I need to plug into how you receive love in order for it to become not transactional, but to become compatible 
love so many questions. I think the first thing in our own heart, we have to have the love of God in our heart, and we can't generate that love that comes from Romans 5.5, 5, he pours his love into our hearts. If we don't have love, we can't share love. So we have to receive that love from God. But if you're not sharing it, then you're not actually going to be received. The more you give, the more you receive. So then once you receive the love, you have to begin sharing it. And that love then is that principle of seeking the, the eternal best interest of people, not necessarily what they want in the moment. And parents know this, that you do, if you love your child, you certainly don't give them everything the child thinks that they need or want that will make them happy, that you are making decisions based on the actual objective best interest of the child, but the goal being for the child to come to a maturity of character where they operate in harmony with God and God's kingdom. So as you talk about then community activity, then certainly there's a aspect where we engage to use our resources and governance of ourselves in ways that are blessing to other people considering and taking into account what they would like, but not deferring or surrendering the authority of our own self-governance, last fruit of the Spirit, governance of oneself, to somebody else's perspectives or opinions. So uh, we can hear the desires, the requests, but we have to then process them through our understanding of reality, just as when we pray to God, I know many of us have made many requests to God, and that we are thankful that he processes it through his wisdom and doesn't give us everything we request. Uh, because, because not everything we request is healthy for us, even when we are, from our motive, thinking it's healthy for us. And, and, and so, so I think there's a balance there. I don't think it's an either or. I think it is a um, balance between our own authority over the decisions and the resources that we govern and the persons we're trying to help. You can't help really help people against their will. You know, a person convinced against uh, uh, of their will is of the same opinion still, so to speak. But one of the other things that I think is we talk about love, love, people can love each other. People can love each other. Institutions cannot. Governments cannot love. People can love. And one of the corruptions, I think, of the devil is to get our good-hearted, loving desires to be replaced by governmental programs mm -hmm. so that we don't get the joy of loving people, we don't get to know people, we don't get the practice and the exercise of the circuitry that God has given us to grow our own hearts in love, we don't meet people face to face, so prejudices and biases don't get broken down. The persons who might be benefited don't get the, the joy of being cared about by another person. This person cares about me. There is redemption in that. What was so powerful in Jesus' ministry is he personally dealt with people. They met him. They heard him. They saw him. That He was touched by them. This is powerful much more powerful than a governmental institution doing something with a systemized check in the mail. So I think there's a place, but we don't want for the church to, to defer its responsibilities <laughs> as the hands and feet of Christ into uh, human governmental systems, do we? No. You know, the... the um one of the very first guests we ever had on the program was Ron Hall. Ron Hall is uh, the one, the story, same kind of, diff same kind of different as me. Uh, he had a wife that volunteered at a homeless shelter. Uh, he was a very successful art dealer and wound up uh, helping his wife out and encountering a very angry uh, African-American man, homeless man, who uh, said that uh, the lesson he learned about interacting with uh, when Ron Hall tried to attempt to be his friend, he said, now let me understand something. When you go fishing, uh, you have this thing called catch and release. He said, when I go fishing, it's catch and then go share the meal with my family and all who are around. Now, if you're going to treat me as a friend like you do when you go fishing, 
and that's catch and release, I don't want to be your friend. But if you're going to share your friendship and be with me for the long term, uh, like I am with my family, when I catch a fish, I go home and share it with all of them, well then maybe there's some chance for you and I to become friends. And so it became a, a, a award-winning movie and a very compelling story, and Ron's still out there telling this story, same kind of different as me. Uh, this was an example of how hard it was to love the unlovely, but having the unlovely not able to receive love without having it framed in their own experiential understanding of life and what they had been through. Well, it took time. Uh, so, so I like what you're describing. And, and as an expert in the Old Testament, the Bible principles, when the Bible talks about we must do justice to the widow, to the orphan, to the homeless, was it talking about setting up orphanages run by the state? No. No, that's not what it was talking about. It was talking about the people caring for the people, adopting the orphan and bringing them into your home and making them part of the family, uh, making the widow uh, your adopted uh, family member and caring. So Jesus on the cross says to John, this is your mother, and to his mother, this is your son. This is how uh, you're going to care for this widow, Mary, and who don't, no longer has a son. We put her in relationship with a person who'll care for her. And I think one of the corruptions is to take the heart, because God has put this in our heart to love people. And, and we see the righteousness of loving people and caring for the disenfranchised and caring for the homeless and caring for, for the mentally ill and caring for the orphan and caring for the, we see the righteousness in it. But I think the devil tricks people into taking the heart out, taking the soul out, taking the people to people connection out and, in, and inserting a government institution that is basically heartless and soulless. I have said many times that uh, as a child of the 50s that I remember that the uh, I, I lived on a street and there was a long set of stairs going down to the street below us. And right at the bottom of the street was the local Catholic parish. And you would, as you came down the last set of steps, you were along the fence line, the gate uh, to the parish, and the gate was never locked. And the door to the parish was, to the, to the Catholic Church was never locked. Living in Pittsburgh, which is a three shift uh, environment in the steel mill days, uh, there was to be some place for everyone 24 hours a day, seven days a week to be able to go to uh, light a candle to do whatever it was that they did in the Catholic Church. And I would literally see people come in empty handed and leave with two bags in their arms. You could see a pair of blue jeans or a shirt or something coming out of one of them and you would see uh, the uh, top of a milk carton or uh, uh, the plastic wrap of, uh, uh, or back then the paper bag of a loaf of bread. And they went in empty-handed, but they came out with something, and they were being provided with goods and services based on their need from the local parish. And it occurred to me later in life when I went to full-time ministry, uh, and we set up a Joseph storehouse that was open to the local community uh, that we would provide canned goods and, and food products uh, contributed by the congregation uh, to support the local community based on their need and there was no requirement for them to hear the gospel. There was no cost to them that, that, that if we could build relationships this way and open up the dialogue but people with an empty stomach it's hard to reach them with the gospel when their stomach's grumbling and they haven't had a meal in a couple of days and so we we took that approach that we were going to be a house of prayer uh, for all people and that we were going to have a publicly announced storehouse that just said come as you are come and get what you need uh, we limited it to all you could fit into two large grocery bags uh, per visit 
And if you came the next day, then you'd get to the next day. If you came the next day, you'd get to the next day. We didn't, but we had somebody who man, manned it, and they were the relationship builder. They were the one that over time, they became Miss Sally, and they became the one that people got sure. to know. The sure. Fa people, the, people contact makes a difference, doesn't it? It does. It does. I think that's why, uh, uh, oddly enough, when I was a boy, I went to New York City. I wound up moving there and living there. But, the, but Horner and Hard Art, which was an automat, uh, there was no human interface. You put money into a machine, you picked a sandwich, you picked a meal, whatever it was. It was, it was the original automat system. Uh, there was something missing, and I always felt like there was something missing. Uh, I liked to sit at the counter at a diner. I like to sit at the counter at Waffle House. I like to interact and have a conversation with someone there. I'm often alone and I'm single. Uh, I often go to places like that, diners, and, and sit there at the counter to, to have community. So would we say godly principles would have the impact of bringing people together? Ungodly principles would be dividing people apart putting barriers and make it harder for people to connect. Would that be fair to say? Absolutely. Yeah. And so if you look at what's happened in society, you can actually see principles at work. Some principles and some actions are, are bringing people together. Some actions are dividing people and separating people apart, making it harder for people to connect. But, you know, we are called the body of Christ. And the metaphor of the body is like our bodies don't do well if we start cutting pieces off. <laughs> And, and, and neither, neither does our society. When we start fragmenting our society into different segments that are separated from other segments of the society, the society suffers because we are not designed to be separated like that. We're designed to have unity, but unity on principles uh, that God built relationships to operate upon, which would be respect, truth, other-centered love, uh, uh, honesty. In other words, the principles of God are what make relationships healthy. We're going to take a short break, but on the other side of the break, I want to talk about how what we're seeing as on the streets of America today and the message that's being touted by so many uh, is not a message of love. It's a message of division. And it's it is uh, shame-based provocation and dictatorial as to how I should express my love for a people group or a cause or an event uh, where one is imposing their, their definition, their imprint, their methodology to how I must respond or I am now wrong. Uh, I'm now a racist, I'm now a bigot, I'm a misogynist, I'm a xenophobe, I'm a homophobe, I'm an Islamophobe, I'm all these things. If I don't conform to man's standard uh, as they are promoting it on the streets and uh, certainly love never fails. However, how do we love in the face of these kind of circumstances and how can we affect change? Uh, I think the Helen Keller story that you share in your blog is a story I didn't know about Helen Keller. Uh, I didn't know about uh, how she was raised, how she was treated, and how this, this uh, caretaker came in, the nanny came in, and kind of turned things around with what might be considered to be tough love but nevertheless, it was out of love, that's why it worked. It wasn't out of punishment or shame or guilt or retribution. It was done out of knowing that this was something that needed to happen in order to transition from function, from non-functional to functional. Yeah. We've been talking with Dr. Timothy Jennings, author of The God-Shaped Heart, The God-Shaped Brain, The Aging Brain, and he is an active blogger on uh, comeandreason.com. He appears with us in the 10 o'clock hour on the third Thursday of every month. And the conversations have shifted from the medical, the brain chemistry, to uh, the matters of the heart as they have to do with the concept of love. And God has given us this infinite capacity to love, 
He's also given us an infinite capacity to be loved. Uh, however, our experiences seem to shape our capacity to be loved and how we receive love is oftentimes how we give or do not give love and it's a fear-based system. Uh, we're talking about how we can love and be loved in a biblical context, in a biblical model. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back with Dr. Timothy Jennings. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker inviting you to join me and my special featured guest twice per month with Rabbi Zeb Parat and Carl Gallops and monthly with Dr. Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Lake, Dr. Timothy Jennings, Dr. Mark Baker, Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, Drs. Michelle and Mark Sherwood, Dr. Kim Moss, Derek Gilbert, Peter Rosenberger, Brandon Gallops, Steve Fair, Stephen Black, and Sean Tabbitt for in-depth insights into Israel, prophecy, the unseen realm, the brain, spiritual warfare, overcoming shame, mysteries of the Bible, prophetic insights, the sensational and the supernatural, caregiving, addiction recovering, understanding the divided heart, same-sex attraction, and much more. We're proud to feature some of the greatest biblical minds from both Israel and around the United States. Check out our featured guest lineup and 24-7 feed on IgnitingAnation.com or watch by topic on any device with our free apps. If you can't find what you need, you're just not looking in the right place. Follow us on social media and download our free apps today. With today's smartphone technology, news, information, sports, and entertainment is widely available and almost unbounded. But what about the information that believers in Yeshua are looking for? Well, now there's an app for that. Igniting a Nation now has apps available for Android and iPhone. With our app, you'll gain access to everything you would in our website, from our featured guests to our live streaming shows. Visit Google Play or the Apple Store and download Igniting a Nation's new app today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker inviting you to join me and Israel's number one rated guide, Edo Kanan, for our annual Israel trip. Our 2022 trip is now open for registration for our 18th trip to Israel. Our trip will take us from Tel Aviv to the Galilee, down to the Dead Sea, and four nights in Jerusalem. You will walk where Yeshua walked and watch the Bible turn from black and white to living color. Visit ignitinganation.com forward slash events and download the registration form today. No, it's not too early to take advantage of our payment plan designed to fit any budget. All of our trips sell out and we want you to experience this life-changing journey. Registration is now open for April 2nd to 13th, 2022. And we promise you, you will never read your Bible the same way again. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Dr. Timothy Jennings, as we do on the third Thursday of every month in the 10 o'clock hour, one of our special featured guests. You can find his channel on Roku, Apple TV, on Amazon Prime, and on Chromecast, and on any of our apps under our featured guest program. Just type in the name Timothy Jennings, and all of our programming with Timothy will Dr. Jennings will pop up. He is also an avid writer, contributor to his ministry website, comeandreason.com, and he is the translator, a 15-year project of the Remedy Bible Translation. And we talked about the Psalms last time we were together, and uh, it was, it was uh, quite a testimony to uh, trying to convey the message of the Bible in a 21st century context and looking at the application, which is really what we're talking about today. We're boiling it down to the single concept of love and love in the face of hate, love in the face of history, love in the face of division uh, becomes how, how do we do that and what does love really look like. And before we went to break, I mentioned the story that you have written and recorded in the blog that's on commonreason.com. Uh, which is your uh, uh, discussion about love, and you use that story as an example. Would you share that with the audience? Helen Keller, and for those who don't know who Helen Keller was, she was a, a 
person who was born uh, deaf, dumb, and blind, uh, mute, I guess they would say today, and, uh, and her mother had great compassion and sympathy and love for this child, and because of that, the mother really only did not want to add more burdens to the child, and so the child grew up without any discipline, without any boundaries, and, and she, she just was kind of like almost a wild child around the home. And when she was probably around 10, 11 years, maybe 8, 10 years of age, uh, they brought in a teacher, a special ed teacher at that time, uh, named Annie Sullivan. And Annie Sullivan tried to teach her, but she couldn't teach her around her mother because every time she tried to intervene and hold the child accountable, the mother would intervene and say, no, you're hurting the child, don't do that. And so uh, Annie set a boundary, said, I will only teach this child if, if I can have her away from the mother. So they took her away from the mother, and the first thing she tried to do, or one of the first things, was just teach her to hold a spoon when she ate instead of just eating with her hands like an animal. And so she put a spoon in her hand and the child threw it and put a spoon in her hand and the child threw it. And this went on for hundreds of spoons. And, and then the, and then the uh, um, Helen slaps Annie. And what does Annie do? She slapped her right back. And eventually um, she started using the spoon. And then she taught her how to uh, uh, the alphabet by feeling it on her hand. And then she taught her sign language. And then she taught her braille. And eventually opens the entire word, world to her and she gets a college education. The point is... The slapping her back was not an act of hate or an act of not loving, it was an act of love. It was setting a boundary to an unruly child to teach herself discipline so that she would stop long enough to learn. But what do you think would happen today in our society today if there was a similar situation and a social worker was brought in and a social worker slapped a deaf, mute, and blind child? Don't you think that the, there would be riots on the street demanding that that social worker be imprisoned? Okay, and in fact, I'm pointing out the difference between love functionally and love emotionally. The mother loved Helen emotionally, but she did not know how to put functional love into action, and her sympathy and empathy caused her to not hold Helen accountable, which prevented her from developing and kept her uh, basically infantilized. Whereas Annie came along and held her accountable, set boundaries with her, even slapped her back when it became necessary, but taught her and she grew and developed and became an autonomous and independent person. So who ultimately in action loved her more? It was Annie. And so there's a powerful lesson for life. People who find themselves with real problems, deaf, mute, blind, uh, real problems. Oftentimes our society today sends the message we shouldn't expect anything from them. Just don't ever hold them accountable. Let them get away and do anything they want. But if we do that, we actually contribute to the destruction of their character. And if we love them, we want to hold them accountable to, to achieve and function to the highest abilities that they are actually capable of functioning at. And that may be requiring some type of discipline, coming from the root word disciple, which means to teach. Not punishment, which comes from the root word punitive, which means to act, exact vengeance upon. So in this current uh, disruption, uh, societal disruption that's going on, and there's a multiplicity of voices now lending their, their message to this, all of them are dealing with the institution uh, as opposed to the people who make up those institutions. And we clearly conveyed at the beginning of the show that institutions can't love that corporations can't love, it's the people within those corporations that are the, are the, are the uh, arbiters of love. Uh, but yet the cry is to tear down, as this cry was for us in the 60s, was to tear down the establishment. Uh, we didn't recognize that it was individuals' decisions, we thought it was a collaborative corporate. The United States government has engaged us in Vietnam. Uh, there were individuals who were pulling at those purse strings who were making an economic decisions, not worried about the loss of life or the impact of the family. We, we didn't know that then. We, didn't, we, weren't, we weren't wise. We were wise in our own eyes, but we, we had no understanding of how things worked. And uh, as I listened to the cries that are on the street today, it's clear that the people who are protesting don't understand how things work. This is critical what you just said. 
I gave the example of George Washington's doctors not understanding how things worked and caused harm. Annie's, uh, Helen Keller's mother uh, not understanding how things worked and caused harm. What you described in the 60s, not understanding. And, and so one of the things that truth, uh, excuse me, that love does is love always pursues truth. Love never aligns itself willingly and knowingly with lies and deception. Love never does, because love comes from God and God is the source of all truth. So genuine love will have a heart that's pursuing truth, pursuing what's actually real. However, those who are in darkness, Jesus said, don't wanna come into the light, okay? So I, I don't know if you heard this statement, truth sounds like hate to those who hate the truth. And so you're going to hear a lot of this kind of things that when people speak truth and love, like I talked a moment ago, you'll hear people who are just historically in gospel message in certain parts of the world, certain societies, certain institutions, just preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ will be, will be called hate speech. And so there is this idea out there that if you speak truth about loving people as Jesus loves people, that we are one human race uh, created by God in his image, that some people are saying to say that today, it's hate speech. It's not. It's the message of God. We are one human race. And, and we have one sickness of heart that we got from Adam and Eve, and we have one solution for that sickness of heart, and that's Jesus Christ. And when we let Jesus into our lives, and, and he changes our hearts, we love everyone as God loves us. But what happens is, and this is one of the devil's strategies, the devil will take people who are not seeking righteousness. They're not seeking it. They're actually against righteousness. They're unrighteous. And he will get those unrighteous to do an act of evil, rape somebody, murder somebody, do an act of evil. And then the righteous, the innocent, who are not party to it, he stirs up an outrage. That's outrageous. That's wrong. And it is. And then he fuels that sense of outrage to right the wrong, to deal with the evildoer through Satan's methods. Let's go out and stone them. Let's go out and attack them. Let's go out and punish them. And so then we will attack the ones we see at fault for the evil, and it was evil. Nobody's going to say it wasn't evil. But then we will eye for an eye, and the whole world goes blind. And you know the Old Testament eye for an eye was not actually trying to implement the best standard of treating people. Right. They were trying to limit the amount of damage you could do because they were slaves, former slaves, and somebody put your eye out, you'd murder them or you'd kill them for it. And you say, no, 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 we have to be a limit on how much retaliation you can do. You know, when we look at, at social justice through the God's eyes, God is the creator of social justice. He created the model for uh, safe sanctuary cities for you to escape to so that you get a fair trial. Uh, he created the uh, Shemitah, the redemption of the things that you worked for. Uh, by gleaning. Uh, by gleaning. Uh, yeah. You know, gleaning in the fields, Naomi and Ruth. For uh, the, for, for, you know, he set up a system where people that didn't have resources could be fed. And uh, if you didn't have anything, you could become a bond servant, not a slave, a bond servant and work for six years to obtain something and gain your release and walk away having something. Uh, the story of uh, Jacob and Rachel uh, yeah. is, is the perfect example. Okay, he came empty handed. He had nothing, he didn't have flocks and herds. Okay, he, he fell in love with Rachel and agreed to work for Laban for seven years. When, when Laban deceived him and gave him Leah, he didn't protest, he didn't rally, he didn't get a bunch of people to march upon Laban's home. He renegotiated the deal, but say, now this time I'll work for you for seven years, but you pay up front. At the end of 14 years, he, has an, he does an inventory. I've got two wives, I've got a bunch of kids, and uh, I have no wealth of my own. I'll stay on for seven more years. Right? And this time I will build my wealth, and here's the agreement I will make. I'll work for seven years and the speckled and spotted and striped ones will become mine and the solid color will become yours. And when he left after 21 years of 
indentured servitude for a personal gain. Uh, he was released and he left with great wealth, with great flocks and herds, lots of children, lots of sons, lots of wives, and, and was servants. Able, and servants. And he understood this model, and we see that even Jesus talks about the wicked master and the wicked servant. Okay, Jacob was not a wicked servant. Laban, on the other hand, was a wicked master. Uh, he was out for his own self-interest. So this is a model that says that you can work to obtain, and it's not in uh, uh, slavery uh, where you are reduced to nothing but having credit at the company store, you actually have the opportunity to create wealth for yourself and improve your human condition. It's about developing autonomy and independence yes. so that you can be a sentient being operating in governance of yourself as God designed. That's the real goal, isn't it? It is. It is. And people want independence, and, and, and they, but, but within a community, where uh, we've held, we've, we have allowed, from a social justice perspective, uh, we haven't paid attention to the statistical data that says that 70% of those incarcerated have a literacy rate below fifth grade, and that 90% uh, of all youth in youth detention have a reading level below the third grade, and their parents are functionally illiterate, so they don't have the capability to teach their kids how to read. Well, if our prisons are filled with people that have learning disabilities and have literacy problems, and that seems to be the core common issue. Should we not get behind literacy programs to bring into the inner city and bring into the communities and help them solve their problem, uh, which is literacy? That's the root core problem, and get them plugged into church programs because we also have statistical data that says if you're in a church program, you learn about parenting, you learn about God's plan for marriage, and you don't abandon your children. You have uh, not fatherlessness. You see, when you talk about the church program, and then maybe a church school that goes with the church program, what happens is that there are people connecting with people who are concerned about the people. Yes. And so it's not just a student sitting in a pew, a number in a row, and like in a public system. It is actually people, and we then take interest in the people. And so if there's a student in the church school that's struggling, and they're a member of the local church, the local church investigates and they come in and say, oh, maybe you, you have this or that going on, and they rally to help. This is the godly and biblical model to uplift lift. Again, when we put human institutions in place of the human relationship, it makes barriers to God's design, in my view. Does that mean that all human institutions should be done away with? I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm just suggesting you can't win God's cause by using Satan's methods. That's, that's so very true. At, at the heart of this hate speak, and it's exactly what it is, it's hate speak. It is pitting one person against another and then using shame as a weapon as if um, the sins of the Father are being visited on every generation, whether you love God or hate God, and that wasn't God's model. God's model was to visit the uh, sins of the Father uh, to the third and fourth generation of those who hated him uh, but for those who love him to visit uh, them for a thousand generations. Mercies. You know, with, with uh, blessings. Yes. Uh, and so the message there is love. The message at the heart of that is love. It's, it's, a, ver it's a love versus hate mentality. And uh, what's being stoked on the streets is a hate mentality that you, just because of your skin color, you are in the wrong. You are personally responsible for the actions of uh, the Kennedy family in bringing slaves over to America. Um, I think I shared with you a long time ago that people would say to me, well, you grew up in the 60s. Where were you when Kennedy got shot? And I, I, I said, I've been asked that so many times, I'm beginning to wonder if I'm a suspect. Uh, they asked me where I was when 9-11 happened. I said, look, I, am I a suspect? Uh, you know, I became, it was comical. Uh, but but it was actually true is is that you know are we being are we painting everyone uh, from one side of the fence 
with the same paintbrush and there can be no healing to ever take place when you label an entire population by skin color saying that every white person is responsible for slavery. Uh, we weren't in this country. My people weren't here. Uh, we were being victimized and put into ghettos and pogroms and shtetls um, long before we ever arrived on the shores of America. I've lived through over 25 percent of America's history uh, and I know anti-Semitism firsthand. I don't know anything about uh, segregation other than the fact that I couldn't drink from certain water fountains that that African Americans also could not drink from. It said no blacks or Jews. Uh, there's very few with the memory. They said I don't remember it saying no blacks and Jews and I said because you're not Jewish. Uh, we knew the places. We knew the clubs we couldn't go to. We knew in Pittsburgh the places that we were not welcome. Uh, the country clubs we could play golf as as a guest but we could never be a member. We knew what restaurants uh, would not serve us uh, and we didn't frequent those restaurants because they made it very clear. Well, we were, were suffered the same level of discrimination but you have never seen a protest of the Jewish community rallying together to stand against Gentile persecution. And what happens in the heart of the one who hates? What happens in their heart? Can you hate someone for any reason and 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 not be damaged by that hate? No. And that's the that and, and that's why Jesus teaches the principle of to turn the other cheek, to to pray for those who persecute you, uh, and to love your enemies so that you might be children of your Father in heaven. Because when somebody hates us and does us wrong, if we don't. Uh, root out that hatred, then we will harden our own hearts and we will be part of the hate world. But if we uh, forgive them and practice godly methods, it doesn't mean that their activities are right. They're still wrong. They're still they're still hateful and evil. But it prevents us from from being infected with those same principles and helps us grow in godly principles to be part of God's kingdom. This is the conundrum this is the, the 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 part that concerns me is that we have people who are self-defined as Christians who are taking this banner of hate up and this banner of social justice up without understanding what the Word of God says and this goes to the same literacy problem that the community in which they're trying to serve is suffering with a similar form of literacy they can't read it all and the Christians, so-called Christians, don't read the Bible, so they don't know what God's plan for love is. So it's a literacy problem at the root, at the core of both sides of this equation. And there's some very misguided people because what is coming out of this is a higher degree of anti-Semitism. Uh, it's now a unified. Uh, the people who are joining together in these agendas are bringing their own agenda to it, and because they're well-funded, it's now becoming an anti-Semitic cry and it's surpassing anything which will affect positive change in the community and is now talking about defunding police. Uh, you as a psychiatrist know uh, what will happen in the rise in lawlessness uh, if there is not some check and balance system within society because society, every imagination of uh, the uh, uh, of, of, a, of a man's heart is wicked. Yep. And so this is what's going to usher in that season of lawlessness, which you and I both know the Bible tells us is going to happen, it is happening, for the purpose of bringing about the revealing the son of perdition and bringing about the return of Messiah. So on one hand, all is well with my soul. On the other hand is... Uh, um, uh, I, I want to make some positive contribution to the well-being of those who are feeling persecuted and those who are feeling disenfranchised and love them and help them to improve their conditions so that they don't have to live with this any longer. We've been talking with Dr. Timothy Jennings, uh, author of The God-Shaped Heart and an uh, avid blogger at ComeAndReason.com, his ministry website. He joins us on the third Thursday of every month at the 10 o'clock hour. He is a dear friend of the program. He is one of my trusted people. And he gives sound biblical counsel uh, 
uh, while being a board certified psychiatrist. So if, uh, if you're searching for a psychiatrist, find out if they have a heart for the Lord because uh, Dr. Timothy Jennings is a living, breathing example of piercing the troubles of the mind by dealing with the matters of the heart. And when they become in alignment, the whole person finds healing. Dr. Timothy Jennings, thank you for your great contribution, your great work. Thank you for being a friend of this program. We look forward to seeing you next month. May the Lord bless all the works of your hands. Eric, thank you and blessings to you. God bless you. We're gonna take a short break and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. <music>